Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Owen Taylor, and I have the pleasure of being the pastor here at Beaver Dam and Rousey's Chapel. And I'm excited that you are joining us for our worship time this morning. Uh, I always like to start our time together by giving a shout out to those who make this effort possible, to the, the faithful donors and givers here at Beaver Dam, and also to uh, my wife, Tina, who is monitoring the, the Facebook feed this morning. So uh, give her a shout out. She's always uh, up for a conversation. And uh, just a, an announcement that we have going on in the life of the church. On February the 11th, we're having our, our annual chili cook-off. Uh, that is the Saturday before the Super Bowl from 5 to 7. So bring your, your favorite uh, pot of chili, enter it into the contest, and then hang around and sample some of the various chilies that, we ha that we'll have here at Beaver Dam. Uh, it's, there's no cost to the event, but we will be taking up a donation. So I encourage you to join us. So uh, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Let us pray. Gracious God, we, we thank you for this time together. We thank you that we have the gifts and the technology to be able to gather as a community over this thing we call the internet. Lord, we just invite you to be in this space with us, that you would open our hearts and minds to your word, and may it enlighten us and guide us and inspire us this day. Lord, we raise this prayer to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So our reading this morning comes from the New Testament, from the Gospel of Matthew, and this is chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. Let's hear what the Gospel writer has for us this morning. And this is Jesus speaking. When you pray, don't be like hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that people will see them. I assure you, that's the only reward they'll get. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is present in that secret place. Your Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't pour out a flood of empty words as Gentiles do. They think that by saying many words, they'll be heard. Don't be like them because your father knows what you need before you ask. Pray like this. Our father who is in heaven, uphold the holiness of your name. Bring your kingdom so that your will is done on earth as it is done in heaven. Give us this bread we need for today. Forgive us as, we, as, as for the ways we have wronged you, just as we also forgive those who have wronged us. And don't lead us into temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. If you forgive others for their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, neither will your Father forgive you of your sins. Friends, for the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Amen. You know, I read a, a survey online this week that said one of the phrases that most people want her, to hear said to them with, some, with sincerity is, you are forgiven. It actually ranked number two right behind, I love you. There is something powerful about forgiveness. Yet forgiveness isn't always easy. We want God to forgive us and we trust that God will forgive us. But other people might not be so forgiving, nor do we always forgive them so easily. This is the hard part of conflict, forgiving and letting go of the hurt and the right to retribution. Why do you suppose forgiving is so hard? 
Now, when we're talking about forgiveness, I think it's really a two-way street. It's both giving and receiving. And when it comes to, comes to us being forgiven, one of the challenges that I hear quite often is that I don't deserve to be forgiven, that what I have done is unforgivable. I don't think that's true. Do I think that's true? No. I can understand where it comes from, though. It comes from a place of shame, guilt, and embarrassment. We think and feel that our actions, what we have done, doesn't deserve to be forgiven because we struggle with forgiving others. And as such, we have a tendency to put barriers up within our own minds and by our own actions to keep ourselves from being forgiven. One of the barriers that we tend to put up is this disbelief that Jesus actually died for me. Sure, God sent Jesus to die for our sins, other people's sins, not mine. Because how can God love me that much? Because I've done some horrible things. Have you had those thoughts? I have. But once you realize that God's love is actually that unconditional, that Jesus came not to save you from your sins, you are set free. Set free to live a life that shows how thankful you are for being forgiven. I wish I could stand here and tell you that this is a one and done type thing, that you're forgiven once and you'll never sin again. But, it, but that's not true. It doesn't work that way. You will sin again. It's part of our human condition. And you will see where you have sinned. And you'll ask for forgiveness again. And you will be forgiven again. The hope is that as you progress in your faith, that the sinning will be less. But I don't think it ever completely goes away. Now, some of those feelings of shame, guilt, and embarrassment are also the main reasons why I think it's hard for us to accept forgiveness from others as well. To over, to, for you see, to overcome these feelings, it takes a sense of humbleness. Humbleness in admitting that we've hurt someone by our actions. Humbleness in going before that person and asking for forgiveness. And a humbleness also in trying to do better in the future. If we want to be, be forgiven and know that God forgives us, why do we find it so hard to forgive? Why do we want to hold on to our hurts? You know, forgiving someone for, for you know, forgiving someone for cutting you off in traffic is fairly easy. It's easy because one, we probably because one, we probably don't know that person. And secondly, the hurt was very quick and was superficial. No real damage was done. Now, it is harder for us to forgive someone who has really hurt us, like a friend who has lied to us, or like a brother or sister who still picks on us like we were, like we were young growing up. Or it's hard to forgive someone who's been an abusive parent or a spouse who has had an affair. These hurts cut deeper, and we find it harder to forgive because of the pain and because we are angry. We want that person to feel the same pain that we have, and we want to punish them. We want, to pay, we want them to pay for hurting us. These are valid reasons, and ones that we have all wrestled with at one part, at one time or another. But you know, part of the struggle with this is that, that we think that if we do actually forgive them, that we also need to forget what they did. To me, this might be one of the most biggest misconceptions about forgiveness, that to forgive also means to forget. 
For you see, friends, that simply isn't true. It's not true because it's by remembering what has happened to us in the past, how people have hurt us and how we have hurt others that we gain wisdom. And wisdom is what causes us to change. Now, a word of caution. We need to be careful that we don't jump to conclusions because of our past, that we set healthy boundaries. And just because this other person has hurt us in the past, that doesn't mean that this new person in our life is going to hurt us now. I'm not sure there's a way for us to truly forget the past hurts that we've experienced. Sure, time will help, and it may get a little easier to handle, but they never go away. We need to learn how to uncouple forgiveness and forgetting. For you see, you can forgive without forgetting. It's in forgiveness that we learn to let go of what has happened, even though we may never forget it. Forgiving each other is what we are called to do by God. Jesus told us this in our scripture reading this morning. Today's text from Matthew is Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray. We call this the Lord's Prayer. The part I want to bring your attention to is the part we usually say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I really appreciate the way the Common English Bible translates that verse, verse 12. Forgive us for the ways we have wronged you, just as we also forgive those who have wronged us. You know, that original word is trans, that's translated forgive or trespass is afimi, which means to forgive, to pardon, and to counsel. And this is an important word because it appears over a hundred times in the Bible. So what Jesus is doing here is he is telling us to ask for forgiveness and also to forgive others. And he takes, his, and he takes this teaching one step further in verse 14, and he points out that if we forgive others of their wrongdoings, then we will be forgiven by our Heavenly Father. And if we choose not to forgive, then God won't forgive us. This asking for and giving forgiveness are the crucial conversations that we need to have. There are conversations that we need to have with God, asking God for forgiveness each and every day, and conversations that we need to have with God before coming to the communion table each week. These are conversations where we come before God and admit those places where we've sinned against God, either by thought, action, or even inaction. And what we can also glean from the text is, is that we need to, to be asking forgiveness from others. These conversations can be tough as well. They can be tough be, <clears throat> because, we, because it can be hard for us to admit others that we have done them wrong, that we have sinned against them. Imagine if you put a large piece of paper on the wall outside of your home, and on top of that piece of paper was your name, written beautifully. What would happen if we asked everyone you knew to come by and list those areas where you have sinned against them? Would that list be long? What would be on that list? You think you would be surprised by what's on the list. How would you feel? Would you feel those feelings that we talked about earlier? Shame, guilt, and embarrassment? What would it take for you to go to those people and ask for forgiveness? You know, there's one thing that we haven't touched on when it comes to giving and receiving forgiveness, and that is the relief that we can experience when we have received or given forgiveness. 
when we receive forgiveness, especially from God, there can, be sent, there can be a sense of freedom that we feel, a freedom that brings us inner peace. And when we, when we give forgiveness, we can also feel that same freedom. Now, I know some of you might be out there pondering the question, can we forgive someone who isn't in our lives any longer? Whether by choice, as in we never want to see that person again, or maybe not by choice, because perhaps we don't know where they are in the world, or perhaps they have passed away. Can we still forgive them? Do we need to forgive them? I would say the answer is yes. Yes, we do need to forgive, and we can forgive, because the act of giving forgiveness is one that is personal, and one that is, can be part of our inner being. Giving forgiveness is an action that we take. It's an action that we take to do in order to heal and to let God work in our lives. You know, I'm a big fan of the Big Bang Theory, and I was watching a rerun recently that demonstrates how freeing it can be in giving and receiving forgiveness. It's a scene where uh, it's a scene that Tina is going to be hopefully posting in the comment box that you can go back and watch. It's a scene in which Leonard, one of the lead characters, is is having a conversation with his mother. His mother has always treated him uh, fairly harshly, fairly distant, and kind of treated his whole life as an experiment. And what Leonard does in this in this scene is he forgives her for who she is. He has the epiphany that he realizes that she will never change. And since she can't change, since he doesn't think she can change, there's no reason for him to expect her to change. And he needs to forgive her for being who she is. And what is really fascinating about this is as soon as he realizes this and he says, Mother, I forgive you, he, you can tell a huge weight has been lifted off of his shoulders. And he is freed. You know, this type of forgiveness that Leonard gives his mother is similar to the type of forgiveness that God, that God gives us. That we didn't ask for it, and we might not deserve it, but God still gives it because God loves us the way we are. It's a freeing type of forgiveness. And here's the thing. God wants us to forgive others and ourselves in this same way. God wants us to forgive ourselves. That, my friends, is sometimes a tough one. Sometimes we are our own worst enemies and we find it tough to forgive ourselves of those places where we've sinned against God and where we've sinned against each other. What I propose for you today is to take some time in your room, shut the door in a quiet place, and talk to God about those places where you've sinned, those places where you're struggling forgiving yourself, and then turn the conversation to those places where you're struggling to forgive someone else for the hurts that they've caused you. And then I want you to try to let it go. Let it go and give the forgiveness to those who have hurt you, and then receive the forgiveness that God, our Creator, has for you. And then let me know how it goes. I'd love to hear about your experiences. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, I have enjoyed our time together, and I hope you have too. Uh, if you have, I invite you to hit that like and share key there on Facebook so that others can also uh, hear the message and uh, maybe work on their own forgiveness. But for now, receive this benediction. 
God has forgiven us. We are called to go and forgive others, and that includes ourselves. Go with the blessings of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, y'all. Bye for now.